So good afternoon to everybody and welcome to you all to today's online debate. The topic is which feasible new reconstruction instrument does Europe need and is an initiative of the Per Vierna Chair Program at the European University Institute jointly organized with the Florence School of Banking and Finance and the Tommaso Pados Chiopa Chair, always at the European University Institute. My name is Elena Carletti. I'm a professor of finance at Bocconi University and I will be chairing the debate today. So let me start by welcoming the speaker and presenting them. Marco Buti is the head of cabinet of the European Commissioner for the Economy, therefore of Commissioner Gentiloni. Luis Caricano is a member of the European Parliament, but is also a professor. So uh, he's a professor of economics and innovation on leave at the Instituto di Impresa, the business school. And Ramon Marimon is the holder of the Pierre Werner Chair at the UI and also professor of economics in the department. Uh, lastly, Gian Pisani Ferri is Tommaso Bados Chiopa Chair at the European University Institute, but also professor at Sciences Po in Paris. So first, thank you to all, all of you to join in the debate today and Ramon in particular for taking the initiative in organizing it. So the, to, the topic today is the idea or the need, I would say, of creating either a reconstruction fund or reconstruction instrument for the recovery of Europe. And in these last the, the days, the debate has been heated up, as we know, by the proposal of the French and, uh, the French and German proposal which of course one important proposal and the big step forward in many dimensions, but it's not the only one. So we would like to discuss more broadly what the debate is all about. And I hope that in the discussion, we will touch upon the following issue, whether we're talking about instrument or we're talking about fund, that we will talk about how to fund, finance these instrument or fund, how are we going to distribute the fund across countries and in which form loans versus grants. We know this is a big debate how countries are supposed to use this fund, whether there will be conditionality attached to it, maybe simply also invest in strategic sector or companies rather than be fully free in terms of spending, whether Europe has the institutions that are needed to create this instrument, this fund and manage them. And lastly, but not less important, the dichotomy in a way between Europe and the Euro area. So are we creating an instrument or a fund that is more oriented towards the whole European area or just the Euro area? And if so, I mean, given the differences, what implications we can draw from this? So let me stop here in terms of organization. We first have Marco and then Luis for 10 minutes each. Then we will have Ramon and Jean, and then we will have a little debate between you but then we want to open uh, the floor for Q&A from the floor. So for the participant in the Zoom uh, technology, you, are, uh, you can ask a question at any time. So feel free to already ask questions during the presentation of the speakers and we collect them and ask them in the later stage. Please try to post brief question, possibly with the indication of the person you would like the question to be addressed to, if it is a specific question to one particular speaker. So with this, let me give the floor to Marco for his uh, intervention and please try to stick to the time so that we can have a debate in the following moment. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, very Thank you very much, Elena. Thanks to all of you. Nice to, to see such good friends and uh, thanks to, uh, to Ramon for the organization. I mean, what is interesting in your title uh, are in particular the two um, words in brackets. So feasibility and whether we are talking about instrument or instruments. Um, uh, I'll try to give a bit of uh, hints on all, all this uh, um, in my presentation. I would like to do, to, to do three things uh, very quickly. One is to pause for a moment on the nature of the crisis because you have to have a good diagnosis uh, to uh, uh, put to, uh, together the right policy response. Uh, I mean, given my previous life, uh, Having gone through uh, the financial crisis, I have in mind uh, always a bit that uh, to, to highlight the differences or the similarities. Second uh, is uh, how to overcome uh, the fragmentation uh, while fostering the recovery. And third, uh, the forthcoming proposals of the, of the Commission. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you in detail what is going, we're going to put on, but you'll see, I will, I will do that in a nuanced way, having in mind the 
Franco-German paper. On the nature of the crisis, it's an exogenous shock, is a shock that is symmetric in origin and asymmetric in outcome, and is a systemic uh, shock. So demand, supply, short term, medium term. The fact that it's exogenous implies that the issues of moral hazard, which has uh, actually haunted us throughout the management of the financial crisis, has very little role. The, the Dutch uh, authorities at, at first uh, tried to raise some that the issue, but I think they were rebuffed very quickly. Second point is the sim it is symmetric in origin. Uh, so, I mean, the, the rationale for a common response is there. However, is uh, is and, and is you know risk to be very asymmetric in outcome. So, um, it is important that uh, uh, we have to tackle these divergences. And finally, is a systemic uh, shock. Mm, um, I remember uh, Benoit Curie asking uh, whether the financial crisis will leave scratches or scars. Uh, my feeling is that this is going to leave deep scars. So I'll give you an answer uh, already. Um, for the discussion uh, more on the analytical side, uh, we risk to have here a combination of supply and demand. Economists always look at the uh, supply shock as more permanent and demand shocks are more transient. I wonder whether in this case here would not be actually the opposite uh, with the re rebuilding on the value chain actually taking less time than uh, for the consumers to go back to, uh, um, let's say, normal habits. So this is the, um, the assessment on the nature of the crisis. It's important to have it in mind uh, to, um, uh, to devise the policy response. The second important dimension in the narrative is overcoming fragmentation. I mean, I mentioned it before, um, I was actually asking myself uh, what would be a good, um, you know, dub, uh, uh, how do you, do you dub this, uh, the present crisis? Uh, we had the Great Depression, the Great Recession. I think a good, uh, um, a, a good uh, title for this, but don't, uh, don't steal it from me, it would be the Great Fragmentation. Um, so we have to do um, what is needed in order to avoid that. It is a uh, financial crisis, we had the financial fragmentation, now it's fragmentation across uh, individual regions, uh, countries, uh, sectors, uh, also generations. I've seen uh, latest articles, especially on the US, uh, on uh, those uh, youngsters uh, coming into the, into the labor market, which actually uh, with you know, heavy student loans, uh, having no prospects of recovering actually proper uh, income la uh, later on. But there is an important element which goes beyond these, uh, uh, the, these divergences that I have just mentioned. And it is the fact that during the first phase of our response, which was the suspension of the stability pact, the very substantial loosening of state aid. So during this enabling phase, actually we have fostered divergences endogenously. So these decisions have been absolutely essential to allow national responses, but then the different firepower of member states have actually led to an endogenous increase in divergences. I mean, the most telltelling uh, figures is this uh, of uh, the almost two trillion uh, uh, interventions uh, at the national level uh, uh, adopted by the Commission. Uh, over half is on, on, only ha uh, over half is in Germany only. Mm -hmm. So keep this in mind. And what is even more important, I think, is that uh, these um, divergences here, not only they fragment the single market, but they may actually lead to um, uh, you know, unwanted change in the, in, in the ownership structure of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so these elements here have to be taken into account in devising the policy response. So devising the policy response, that's my third uh, um, slot in this uh, pre presentation. We are going to put forward our, our proposal on this 27th of May, so next week. The overall approach so far is, um, is uh, uh, in Malone, three dimensions, uh, absorb, repair, and transform. So art, but don't use this um, uh, 
this acronym here, uh, it's times are too serious to invent new acronyms. Um, so how we do we uh, devise the policy response? We have two goals, four variables, and three constraints. The two goals is uh, favor the recovery um, of the economy in the short and the medium term, and second, tackle the divergences. I have, I'm insisting a lot on this. The four variables is size, composition, sources of finances, and conditionality. Um, the Franco-German paper have basically answered already from their viewpoint these uh, four uh, variables. Uh, so the size is 500 billion in their view. Composition is only grants, sources is EU borrowing, and conditionality is essentially linked to the semester, plus convergence on taxation in the medium to long term. So this is what the... Um, Franco-German paper basically say, in a nutshell, um, we are going to be, I mean, to position ourselves on this uh, next week. Uh, um, I'm not going to anticipate now what we are going to do, but let's say the gravitas uh, of the Franco-German paper, uh, I think will certainly influence the, uh, the debate. The three constraints are economic coherence. So funds will have to be directed to uh, sectors, regions most affected by the crisis. Uh, we'll have to finance EU public goods and we need to have uh, sufficient speed. So we will need some sort of a bridge solution um, before the new um, fund comes uh, into, uh, into play. Second uh, dimension is political coherence. Uh, why is the first economic coherence is essentially for the commission? The political coherence is essentially for the president of the European Council. So he has to find the um, uh, you know, convergence of all north, south, east, east west, because we need unanimity um, on this. Uh, the, our approach would be to separate this fund or instrument from the baseline MFF uh, and focus uh, on the first uh, couple of years of the new financial perspectives. This uh, um, uh, this fund on the, the region and uh, individuals, uh, countries most uh, uh, affected, whilst uh, um, preserving the cl more classic MFF to take care of, uh, let's say, classic convergence, you know, catching up countries. And finally, there is uh, institutional uh, coherence. Here, I notice one important element uh, for the political scientists in particular, is that for the first time since the beginning of the financial crisis, we have gone back to the community method. So instead of taking automatically the intergovernmental role. So I think this is an important uh, element. So uh, I think in institutional coherence implies uh, we'll also need to make sure that we um, uh, consider new own resources. Uh, um, here, the classic uh, coal which is echoed uh, somehow also more in, a bit implicitly in the Franco-German papers is the classic view of Germany that taxation expenditure have to be at the same level. I think we, had, uh, um, we have to respect subsidiarity in this. We cannot do everything at the European level. For instance, here we are working on an equity support system, which is important for the equity repair. Uh, is part of the R that I, uh, the repair that I used uh, before. Clearly the commission cannot in, in uh, you know, invest directly, enter into the capital of, of uh, companies uh, directly. So subsidiarity here is important. There is an issue of coherence between uh, what we are putting in place, uh, this uh, stability and growth pact reform. Uh, we are under the uh, general uh, escape clause now. And finally, if this goes ahead, I think we will uh, also, I, in my view, be, be more compatible with Karlsruhe um, as in a sense, we would lift somehow the burden from the shoulders, uh, uniquely uh, shoulders of the of the ECB. So having a rebalance, uh, I think, in the policy mix. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. This was a fantastic uh, setting up the scene for the discussion, and uh, all your structure is very welcome. It's interesting that you uh, somehow 
end your uh, intervention by referring to the Karlsruhe decision, which is, of course, is a euro area decision in a way, or at least it impacts the, the ECB and the various central bank of the euro system. Whereas here we are having instead something that is the proposal, the reaction to that, if we want to call it that way, although maybe not strictly connected, is a European level. This is also why I was referring before in this dichotomy between Europe and the euro area. But if that was related in some way to the Karlsruhe, I think it would be a good outcome because it would be a big push towards more action on the fiscal or European side and not only the ECB. Having said that, Luis, please. Grazie, Elena. Thanks all. Uh, thanks to the European University Institute. It's uh, it's uh, great to be here at the Florence School of Banking. Uh, we we are really uh, having a a, um, a a very special moment. It's worth really reflecting on how crucial, how critical on this. Let me just start uh, by by saying what the European response has been up to now, uh, briefly, and then talking about what. So a little bit setting the stage on the on the dimensions that that maybe. Uh, Marco hasn't touched that much, and then make make a, a couple of suggestions about physical reconstruction in, instruments. Uh, in terms of setting the stage, just to say that uh, the European response up to today has had uh, has built has has concentrated on building two main lines of defense, and that uh, Ramon does any work? Some problem with sound? Is that, is that a problem? No, I, I I don't know what Ramon had in mind. The sound broke for a second, but now it's fine. All right, say. sorry about that. Apologies. No, 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 it's not your fault. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, so so uh, there have been there are three potential lines of defense. The first one is the European Central Bank has been the only institution actually taking action. The European Commission has more been letting others take action action until today, but but the European Central Bank has been the main line of defense up to today with uh, the 750 billion pandemic uh, emergency purchase uh, program and with 120 billion left in the PSPP, the public sector purchase program. Um, the difficulty of making the ECB the main line of defense, it's evident and has, uh, it's partly the political support that the ECB's actions can take. Uh, we know that at the, at, the, at the speed that the ECB is buying a debt right now, it will uh, consume all of these programs by October. Can it recommence? Can it do new programs? So there's a political difficulty and there is a legal difficulty which has to do uh, with uh, the restrictions on monetary financing in the treaties and the fact that uh, those restrictions, as Elena was pointing out, have been made even more evident and made very uh, scary in some sense for of us by the Karlsruhe ruling, uh, ruling, which makes more likely that the ECB has to take the actions that the Karlsruhe court takes because people are going to have doubts about the ability of the ECB to, to, to make decisions. Um, so the ECB has, has been constrained. Uh, just to put it very, very simply and not to enter into too much uh, detail, uh, the PPP has been designed to allow the ECB a larger, the pandemic emergency program, this first line of defense has been designed to let the ECB take a more uh, flexible approach and potentially not follow the restrictions that traditionally it has had to follow concerning the limit on how much it buys and the proportion of what it buys in every uh, country um, to eliminate those restrictions or to reduce those restrictions and allow the bank to support the, the countries which are more in need. Kazre doesn't rule on PPP but it rules on the previous program, the PSPP, and says those restrictions are crucial uh, if you don't follow those restrictions, then it's monetary financing and you're going against the Article 123 of the treaty. Thus, I think weakening, maybe fatally, fatally, we see how all this plays over the next few weeks, the, the first line and the main line of defense in the crisis. The second line of defense in the crisis is the one that the Eurogroup group has put together, which are three instruments in the form of loans. Uh, the European Investment Bank, which was 25 billion on the table, the European Commission's borrowing of 100 billion for the SURE program uh, with guarantees from the state. So instead of here it being a, a, a program directly by the member states, the Commission borrows the member states of the guarantees and the Commission uses it to support unemployment insurance schemes in different countries or short term insurance schemes. And thirdly, the ESM. The ESM has been the main uh, tool, the main uh, line of support uh, against the crisis in the past, uh, 
uh, it's a very large instrument. It has uh, 80 billion in, in subscribed capital out of, uh, out up to, uh, let me see the exact number, 800, if I'm not wrong, uh, 800 in total capital, and it has a limit, uh, subscribed capital 700, sorry, not 800, 700 billion, and a maximum lending capacity of 500 billion. So the ESM is a big instrument, and it has come in with a decision of the Eurogroup with a special program that should make it quite useful, which is uh, this pandemic emergency program that allows states to borrow without the Troika, with a conditionality, without the usual stigma of the ESM. Sadly, this aspect of the second line of defense, which is the main firepower here, it's proving to be much less useful than we would have liked because the states that most would want it and the states that have negotiated to decrease conditionality, which are Italy and Spain, have actually said, oh, we we are scared of using it because we think it makes us look bad with the markets and with our voters. Then uh, those are our are, 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 are loans. And as we all know, uh, these are loans to very indebted countries that make these indebted countries more at risk. So what is the third line of defense? The third line of defense is this recovery instrument and these reconstruction instruments that we are going to center our discussion on today, all of us, which are basically the idea is let's put here an instrument that is not not uh, a, a further loans piling on loans on loans in these member states that are going to exit the crisis with a debt overhang, but let's all of Europe borrow together and inject direct spending, direct investment in the countries. Um, the European Parliament had a resolution uh, last week that we are renewed, we're among the promoters, the main promoters, that basically says, look, and, and, and I think I, this should be politically feasible and it should be economically feasible. We say, look, we need a grand bargain for Europe. We need a grand deal for Europe. And the grand bargain that the Parliament offers Council and the Parliament puts on the table is to say, look, we can freeze national contributions in monetary terms, maybe not in GNI terms, because you know that GNIs are going down this year. In monetary terms, we won't ask you for more money. And instead, what we do is we put in place these own resources that are going to be enough to pay for this, uh, for this borrowing that we would take. So we borrow, the commission would borrow a large amount of money. We talk about a billion up to 2 billion, uh, sorry, a billion in uh, Spanish, Italian, and French, a trillion in English, a trillion uh, uh, with a 2 trillion total package. And the commission would borrow that, put it in their budget and use it as a part of this, uh, as a main part of this reconstruction recovery instrument. Um, so the three elements here are no new uh, borrowing by the states, uh, no new extra contributions by the state to the European Union budget, a own resources which uh, basically allow you to pay for the interest and a large borrowing by the Commission. Does this add up? Yes. So just to give you some numbers, if you want, Elena, I don't know how much time you want to give me, but I can put the numbers here so that people have them. I have them if you want to allow me to share a screen, but if not, I will just mention whatever you prefer, you're the boss. Um, any maybe preference? You just, maybe you just mention them if you can. Okay, I'll then... mention them. I'll mention them. So the own resources on the table, according to the projections of the Commission and the Council, uh, the ETS, the uh, expanding emission trading scheme, could be 12 uh, billion. Plastics uh, for non-recyclable plastics is 9 billion. The Digitax, 5 billion, but I think this is a very prudent, I think it's probably more. And the harmonization, the corporate tax-based harmonization that we have been talking in the OCD is 12 billion. That's 38 billion, which is more than enough to pay a 1% interest and repay principal and interest on a large um, a recovery instrument borrowing of 1 billion, of 1 trillion. Sorry, I keep going back to French and Spanish when I, I am, I am, uh, I am translating. A 1 trillion instrument. Uh, but, but, but you would pay the interest in the principal and the repayment of these uh, new uh, own resources. Um, it's true what Marco Butti said, he talked about size, composition, sources of finance and conditionality. Those are four key instruments, but there's the fifth, which is the one I'm mentioning now. It's the key. Uh, yes, we need to know that uh, EU borrowing is good semester, composition grants size 500 billion, that's the French-German instrument, but they didn't really say fifth, where does the money to pay for this borrowing come from? And the parliament is putting on the table a very concrete, politically feasible solution. Let me just finish by talking about the feasibility question in your parenthesis. 
politically feasible because you're telling the states, we know you member states are constrained. We don't need more contributions from you. Economically sensible because it does, uh, by borrowing long term, by allowing you to, um, to invest uh, money immediately, it does the th two things that Marco Butti is putting a condition, as, as necessaries uh, to, to invest in public goods, to direct the spending to the most uh, uh, affected. And it's financially feasible because I think this big instrument, um, longer term borrowing, would fit very much with the demand by, by the scarcity of safe assets in the demand by our citizens for, 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 for investment vehicles that, that give them certainty over the long horizon. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. This is a very interesting proposal. I am not sure how the 38 billion would be enough to borrow up to 1 trillion, given that, for example, for sure, we had the guarantee of 25 for then uh, leveraging it up to 75. But maybe we go back to this number in the discussion. The, the borrowing of 1 trillion uh, in the proposal that we originally made, uh, Kiefer Hofstad and me, would be with a perpetual, uh, with, with a perpetual bond, which the, okay. the, the one or two percent interest on a perpetual bond would be ten to twenty billion. If you talk about the thirty billion, uh, oh, sorry, about the one trillion bond, principal plus interest on a thirty-year bond would exactly be around thirty exactly. billion. So it's exactly enough to pay the principal in the interest year by year. Okay, Ramon. Interventions and all of you to be here. I pretty much agree with the characterization that Marco Butti and, and also Luis had done about the crisis. The important thing of any crisis is more than how it happened and everything is how you get out of it. And on the previous one, we got out with the union a little more reinforced because the role of ECB and having the ESM, but as uh, Marco was now reminding us with uh, scars, with heavy debt too. And the question is, how are we going to get out this time? And I think that now we have uh, the instruments. We have been now just reviewing the, not only the effect of the countries, but the programs that are now in place. And what we're talking today is that since some of these, or most of them, they have a form of debt there is a debt fatigue. I mean, Spain now got the rec historical records in 1909 of uh, sovereign debt. And, and that's why we have so much uh, great expectations about what this recovery fund can be. I think the proposal that we had now on the table, and that's part of the discussion on the French-German initiative, it goes exactly in the right direction on putting the accent on grants and, and then having additional resources on borrowing. I will only add to the characterization of what has been said before, something that is actually in the proposal. The proposal of the French, we Germans, we only discuss about the recovery fund, but this is one out of three things. They also mentioned the importance of having a health strategy for the whole Europe. And they also mentioned about speeding up the green and digital transition. And I think that's much better to think it this way. COVID, I have been asymmetric in the response to for many countries, but it's a strong common shock to the basis of the European Union. I mean, the single market is not working. There are many things that require repair of the union, not just of the countries. So it's not simply how we add more support to the countries in stress, which is right, and find the right instruments, but also how we put the whole European Union at work. And in particular, how to find the new challenges. And at the international level, I think there is absolute need for Europe to play a role. So it is in this context that it is like the broader scale of what we're discussing. More specifically, I think we're discussing one thing which is how we strengthen the fiscal part. We're talking of a fund of 500 billions. In some readings, it means that this initiative is in addition to the, to the one of the, of the commission that we're talking of a trillion. So we're talking of things which are of the order of three times or six times the budget of the year. So 
How are we going to manage that? I think that's very really important. I'm, uh, I'm not uh, sympathetic. The, the parliament has the right principles too. I'm not keen on having perpetual bonds. It's a very expensive instrument. I think now what is important is two transformations, the type of the ESM does, which is you <clears throat> take advantage that the short term is very cheap nowadays to give long-term contracts to the countries. And the same thing is the funding has to be done. Whatever is done is, is done. And I think it's a good idea this is on the side of the European Union, not just the European area. But I think that's very important. How is it going to be structured? In most countries, this will be a treasury. We are not have the position to organize a treasury in a few months. But yes, I would like to know more what is perspective on from the parliament and the commission on this, on how we strengthen uh, the, this fiscal part and in particular this. Other than that, there are other instruments which I think have not been exploited enough as equity. And that's something uh, with other colleagues we have been putting forward. And I think that ULN also had written about that. And I think those other elements, which is being playing other instruments or other institutions by the European Investment Bank and so on. So I think both the IIB and the ESM can play a larger role. And it should not be a contradiction here between the euro area and European Union. Okay, thank you very much. I'm also very interested in going back to your last point on equity. But before we do that, let me give the, now the microphone to Jean. Just one request, please, to the participant. Please write your questions on the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of the screen rather than the Zoom webinar chat, if you can, so that we have them all together and it's easy to organize. Jean, please. Thank you, Elena. Um, there is not much disagreement in this in this panel, so I think I'll put the emphasis on a few points that were mentioned, or, or some that weren't. Among those that weren't man mentioned so much, I would say uh, the the starting point is that the coordination of of health policy um, has been extremely weak. Public health policies have been done on a purely national basis. Now, this is completely understandable in view of the competence of the EU. But as we recover, we're going to face the fact that health situations, sanitary situations are going to be different and there won't be any sort of information system that will make us able to assess the situation across the border. And this means reopening the border will be very difficult. Uh, as soon as there will be an incident across the border, the citizen pressure will be closed again, the, the border, because the contagion is coming from that other country. And if we're not able to reopen, we are going to suffer from political consequences, obviously, but also economic consequences, because the single market cannot work in a situation where uh, borders are not open. Just to give you an example, I spoke to the, 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 the person in charge of all the public work in the, the new transportation system for Paris, and they stopped the, the works the day after the lockdown. And one of the key reasons was that uh, subcontractors from other EU countries were just not there anymore. And so they were, they were vital uh, for those works. And so they stopped. And if we want to, to, to recover, we have to, to restart. Uh, second, something that was mentioned in passing by Marco, I think the public good dimension is extremely important. And also here, the EU hasn't delivered what we would have wished uh, it to deliver. I'm speaking of you know, the boost for research, uh, vaccines, uh, treatment, all that is, I mean, this is completely uncontroversial as regards what the EU has to do. This is fully in its competence, but it has to be done. Now, on the, on the instrument that were mentioned, first, let me uh, say, um, I think the rebalancing that we're seeing with the Franco-German initiative is welcome in its own right. Um, it's welcome politically, but also welcome in view of the weakening of the ECB that comes from the Karlsruhe decision. My fear with the Karlsruhe decision 
is that the Bundesbank will go to the Karlsruhe court and explain that no, 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 the, the PSPP, the, the purchase, asset purchase program, is fully legal because uh, this key is respected, the capital key and the, um, uh, and the 33% 33, 33 limit. And by saying that, it will actually put constraints on further action by the ECB. So this will be a sort of relief in the short term, but more uh, constraints in the medium term. And this basically means that the strategy of subcontracting everything to the ECB, that was the temptation visibly of the heads of state and government, uh, cannot work because it risks uh, to, to, to be facing a sort of legal uh, uh, challenge. Um, and markets obviously anticipating the legal challenge mean that the market will start doubting the, the, the power of the, of the ECB. So I think it's very important to rebalance. Now, are we on the way to this uh, rebalancing we need? I think all the right words were mentioned in the Franco-German declaration. Also, this is very welcome, the fact that they spoke of transfers, they spoke, spoke of spending, they spoke of borrowing, they mentioned a number, all that is very important. Now, we're entering a difficult phase of negotiation because after all, it will be a sort of budgetary negotiation with all the 27, with some member states saying, no, we don't want transfer, we don't want expenditure, we just want loans. That was said explicitly by uh, the Chancellor of uh, Austria. Uh, that's, that will be a, a first uh, you know, controversy. Uh, we don't want to increase spending, so. And we know that the, the frugal four are on this line for the time being. So the question is whether they remain on this line. And second, there will be those saying, okay, we agree uh, to more spending, but we want to have our, our part and our part has to be determined ex ante. So what is very important in this crisis because we're not out of the, you know, the next waves. We don't know where the next wave will hit. Maybe it's a different place. So there's no, way in which we can predetermine where the money should go in terms of allocating to this or that country. It has to be flexible. It has to be allocated um, with respect to needs. Uh, and it has to be financed by contributions by all the member states and the borrowing so that it can be front loaded. Now, this requires a political agreement. And this requires for some countries to accept that this uh, provision will not benefit them because they're not hurt, especially either economically or, or, or in sanitary terms. Uh, and that's going to be a very hard uh, uh, negotiation. So we're not out at all out of the woods. And it's important the way the Commission enters the discussion with its proposals next week. It's important the way the Council discusses. And it's important, in my view, even to maintain the sort of fallback option of doing it as an as a intergovernmental uh, solution if there cannot be a good agreement found at EU level. If it were to reproduce the MFF uh, with this new instrument, that would be ridiculous. That would be against the, the very purpose. Now, to finish, two points that were mentioned, own resources and equity. Own resources may look like sort of, you know, the, um, I mean, what, what, the, what the parliament is about, you want to want own resources because it's a sort of grab for, for power. It is something different. I mean, some of the own resources that were mentioned by, by, by Luis actually are resources only for the EU. They are not resources available at national level because as long as you are, you're in this uh, tax competition uh, climate, you cannot uh, tap those resources at national level. So by, by, by doing it at EU level, you're creating more fiscal space in, 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 in fact. You're creating, your, your, I mean, your, I mean, they are untaxed. And on top of that, you are limiting a tax distortion. So it's good from a micro standpoint, and it's good from a macro standpoint because it creates um, uh, more, more, more room for uh, the, uh, what you, you, you've got to finance in, in the short term. So I think that's essential. Now, the final point I wanted to mention is this equity fund. It's very hard. Um, it's very hard because the question um, I mean, the fragmentation risk that Marco emphasized so strongly, I think he's right. There's a major fragmentation risk. There is a major risk of the new doom loop between uh, states and, and, and companies, not banks or banks on the side, but not mainly banks. And so it needs to be an equity instrument. Now to build an equity instrument, 
what should it be? I mean, this in, in institutional terms, it's extremely hard. Maybe the IB can play a role. Maybe we need to sort of have a two two level uh, system uh, with um, you know institution at national levels that can uh, receive uh, I mean equity from a EU institution. Maybe we need a sort of European Troy hand in a way. You remember the Troy hand for German unification? They they essentially nationalized uh, everything, or they, they got the, the equity of whatever remained from the East Germany, and they, they restructured and, and privatized. I think in, in institutional terms, that there is a lot of work to do there. OK. Thank you very much. I think we have a lot of very interesting points to discuss. So maybe we now can give the floor back to Marco and Luis. Maybe be, while giving back the floor, let me add some of the comments that have already arrived from the audience. So maybe you can already start taking them. The first one is in particular for Marco on Italy. So you say this is an exogenous shock. This has nothing to do with the crisis that we had in 2008 and, and even less 2011. But of course, the countries like Italy have not done the reforms they were supposed to do at the time. Would they be in a better position? if they had done them, and in particular, could we think of those countries somehow coming forward and offering to do these reforms? So that maybe could help in uh, going beyond this moral hazard issue, or at least some resentment, uh, if we want to call it this way, from certain countries. The second point that has also been touched by, I think in particular, Jean, uh, uh, concerned the unanimity. So you want to abandon the intergovernmental inter agreement, that means you need the unanimity. But if you don't have the unanimity, as some countries have already hinted to, in particular to the German and French proposal, are we going back to other forms of agreement? So do we resume others or how do we proceed? Third, and this is also for Louis, taxes. First of all, do we see, I mean, the need of own resources is there, is clear, in particular, if we want to have such a big uh, such a big use of funds, I mean, uh, amount of funds to be able to use that and make it meaningful. But does it mean that we are moving towards a fiscal union? Can we see that in this direction? Or do we see this only as a temporary? Because at the end of the day, the recovery instrument may be of a temporary nature. But if we start now with this European taxation, how do we see this going forward? And one final point, the, before the start of the outbreak, the Commission was very advanced with the Green Deal. Which stage is it now? And uh, is this an opportunity to actually accelerate on the Green Deal? Or is there a risk that this is going to be a little bit abandoned? So maybe we, this time we start with Luis and then Marco, just for a change. Luis, please. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Um... So I was I was mindful to uh, to discuss the intergovernmental uh, threat as, as was as was mentioned by by, by previous speakers. I, I I indeed think uh, there is quite a lot of agreement on the on this panel, and I, I think everything that Ramon and and, and Jean said uh, after me, as as what Marco had said before, is is very very reasonable, and, and I'm in agreement. The intergovernmental issue is, is key, and I wanted to talk to that. Um, so. There are two risks that when you start negotiating this politically are going to be there. Jean has, uh, has pointed them out from the perspective of the northern countries. They want to change this from grants to loans. From the perspective of the eastern countries, they fear that uh, this is less advantageous to them uh, than cohesion money. So they would want to turn it into an MFF so they can, they can get similar, similar uh, resources. Um, are we going to be able to to actually deliver something that looks a little bit like the Franco-German proposal by the end of all this process? Uh, or are we going to just terminally weaken it? Um, I think, as Jean said, uh, if, if we don't want to do this intergovernmental, and you were asking, Elena, at least we do need to have that threat on the table. The only thing that will make Holland or Denmark, whatever, or, or the Eastern countries accept a certain distribution of, or another is to say, okay, Germany and France, if this is not going to work, are going to create this fund on their own and they're going to ask countries to subscribe to it as they want. That would be a disaster for the union. As a member of parliament, I am really happy that, as Marco said, the commission is now following the community method. I think that's a very good thing. I think that the leftovers of the financial crisis, the Eurogroup, the 
all these intergovernmental things are, are, are a pity and, 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 and a mistake, a wrong path for Europe. And I'm glad that we're following the, the, the community method. But the truth of the matter is, if France or Germany cannot get around enough consensus and the parliament cannot get enough consensus along the recovery instrument that we actually need, then we'll have to give up maybe and say, well, here's, here's something else on the table that is less democratic and less European, but it's a solution for something that, that we have. The second question that I want to take, as, as you mentioned my name on them, had to do with taxes. I will move into a fiscal union. So this point Jean made uh, about uh, the fact that it's not because we want more resources for Europe that we're doing that, but because this is going to eliminate distortions and their own resources are actually a benefit fiscally to all the countries in terms of eliminating distortions is the crucial point. Um, we do all know, and I'm sure all four of us on this panel, uh, all of us have written, or Mo has written, and Jean has written, Marco has said it many times, have written it. We, we all agree that we need a fiscal union of some kind to complement the monetary union. And there has to be some, some, uh, something that, that, that goes beyond what we have now. It, it, the problem is we need right now a current response to this crisis, and then we need all the things. Um, in building the common response to the crisis, are we building a germ of a fiscal union? Hopefully. But right now, the effort is actually to solve the current problem. And then uh, we are going to, to also have a probably conference on the future of Europe and settings where we're going to actually hopefully be able to put in place institutions to avoid one thing that I think is, is the key uh, lessons of the two crises, that the Eurozone cannot be a crisis multiplier, it has to be an instrument to reduce the impact of crisis. Right now, every time a crisis comes, we seem to be about to kind of see it explode. Okay, Marco? Uh, you have to unmute, please. Okay, okay. Uh, so no, thanks a lot. No, I mean, uh, there is a remarkable convergence in this panel, so maybe the next seminar we find uh, some uh, dissonant voices. Uh, um, but let me take a few, uh, a few points, I mean, the essentials. Uh, on, um, on taxes, on resources, uh, I think, uh, yes, I think this is the, the direction where we have to go. Uh, consider that it's going to be hard to find it. Um, uh, Luis uh, mentioned some of those uh, of, of the proposals that we have uh, in his paper with uh, Giverostat uh, in the, the European Parliament uh, resolution. Uh, however, uh, we have to be careful because uh, some of those uh, tax bases there are very unstable. You know, if you want to do, if if you have, uh, if you introduce something which is based on changing behavior, like use of plastics. Uh, then you cannot rely on that very much with a, for, for a permanent uh, permanent uh, uh, source of revenue, uh, since that uh, hopefully the, the, the base will shrink because of change in behavior. So yes, I think it's going to be very much into the mind, uh, but finding uh, you know, a robust tax is not, uh, is not uh, an, a very easy job. S second point, um, I think it's important that um, uh, focus uh, um, will be on grants rather than um, loans. Um, no financial wizardry, I think, is, uh, is also a good uh, uh, message. Um, at the same time, I have to say, I would not uh, uh, dismiss completely the relevance of long-term loans. I mean, if you have loans at very, very low maturity, low interest rate, interest rate deferrals, etc., in terms of present value, it's a large transfer. Uh, as well. Uh, so uh, clearly second best, but not uh, totally um, uh, use, uh, useless. We are not going to produce to propose perpetuities. Uh, I'm sorry, Luis, uh, uh, on, on this. I mean, let me uh, let me get out of that uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with a half joke. I mean, perpetuities, uh, um, those who like them, I think they are not really um, debt because you never uh, repay them. Uh, for northern countries and Germany, they are quintessential debt because they never expire. Uh, so the, uh, at the end of the day, I think long-term, yes, perpetuals, uh, no. Ramon, on the long-term contracts with member states, I think the idea of having as part of the uh, access to the resources of the reconstruction uh, 
um, fund or instrument, uh, um, they will be as part of that the uh, programs presented uh, by member states. So, in a sense, this would uh, provide uh, that they uh, identify the right uh, priority in terms of reforms and investment. I think will reduce the stigma and increase ownership. Uh, this uh, links also to the question on uh, Italy. Um, I think Italy needs this uh, program very badly, uh, and it is very important that beyond the emergency response right now, they put in place uh, a program which, uh, on the medium term, shows uh, that the debt goes down. Uh, that is uh, that is the key element. Uh, on Jean, um, EU public goods, yes, in the proposal of the Commission, there will be accent on that, including on uh, healthcare. Let me one point on uh, Kasruhe. Um, uh, I, I told you that I had in mind my experience during the financial crisis. Uh, I have also written it, uh, uh, so a bit of uh, half memoir uh, on this. Uh, I mean, I have always convinced uh, that uh, um, a, a currency union um, and needs a certain amount of risk sharing. Either you get it directly to uh, through the national budgets uh, or the EU budget, so the EU level, or you get it by stealth via the balance sheet of the ECB. Uh, the post 2012 announcement by Draghi implied that the member states, uh, member of the euro area, took the second one. So the intransparent element, which politically was very convenient. Now, I am convinced, always convinced, that the, uh, we will change tack once the political costs or doing risk sharing by stealth would actually overcome, overtake the direct costs of uh, doing it uh, in an explicit way. And I think Kaz Rue points to the fact that we may be at that point. And, uh, and I think one can read, uh, let's say, the German, the Franco-German paper also in that line. Um, on uh, um, the, uh, another element on which I am deeply convinced uh, is that we need an insurance approach, I think in line also with what Jean said. Uh, I'm, um, I think it is becoming evident that the losers of today or, or of yesterday are not necessarily the losers of tomorrow. If you think about uh, um, uh, deglobalization, uh, some fragmentation uh, at the international level, countries relying more on export and external demand are actually those who may uh, have a stronger interest to strengthen the domestic uh, component, domestic mean European, uh, uh, the European single market, and so on, uh, and so on and so forth. So are those who actually may benefit uh, from solidarity tomorrow. Final word on the equity instrument. Uh, yes, uh, Jean, I think what you have uh, outlined is the direction in which we work. Uh, as I said before, commission does not enter directly into this. I think uh, the, uh, using the EIB group, with there we have the European Investment Bank, the European Investment Fund, and the close relations with uh, the national level, be it national promotional banks, uh, um, dedicated uh, special purpose vehicles uh, or uh, uh, investment funds, I think is key to get to, to, to there. So in a decentralized and proper way, obviously it has to be, this has to be designed in a way that tackles the divergences and not, uh, uh, you know, increases them if, the, if it has an, let's say, eligibility requirements, which has uh, uh, more, uh, um, coherent with uh, the economic structure of uh, core Europe compared to the, those of the periphery. Okay, thank you very much. Let me go back to Ramon and Jean, and then we go back to you too. So to Ramon, somebody was asking whether you could explain a little bit what you had in mind with this equity instrument that you mentioned. And secondly, you said the perpetual bonds would be very expensive. And now we have just heard Marco saying we were not going uh, uh, perpetual, but even if you go to very long maturities, in which sense they would be costly and related to this, assuming we are going for long-term maturities in particular, there is going to be one trillion issued. What is the demand for it if the interest rate is 1% of them, as Luis said? Maybe now that we are in a crisis period, that there would be enough demand because probably you would buy safety with those instruments. 
But in a later stage, if these are very long maturities, and maybe rates will go up again, hopefully one day before their maturity, what is the demand going to be? So do we see, okay. I mean, do we see this as a problem? Elena, if you give me also an opportunity to answer Ramon sure, on sure. that particular we, I, topic I, I, afterwards, I will Yeah, yeah, ready. sure, 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 sure. And then maybe to Jean, and then we, we have a second round with you, Luis, certainly on this, and also there are other questions for you as well. On Jan, if we go for the community method, what does this imply for the ESM that is not based on this? Is there going to be a change? Is it going to lose importance? How do we think about it? And related partly to this, are we going to see the stability and growth path to change during the crisis and eventually how? So maybe Ramon first. Okay, probably the equity you can answer yourself, Elena. <laughs> but I think the idea here is to open up the instruments, set of instruments. And in particular, there are many firms that uh, I think it's, they might accept uh, and it will be good for them as an instrument. Yeah. Of course, you have to manage properly. You have to, if you have to do it, maybe from the AIB, as uh, was saying Marco, and they have a lot of experience, but it's very important to have a balance on what uh, it was being expressed before that but because now we have more flexibility on the state aid that's making the whole single market more unequal so all the instruments we can have from competition policy to using not just that i mean so that's where forms of equity or forms of, uh, of more liquidity and all these different forms have to help. And of course, this is an instrument for very small SMEs uh, is not working, but I mean, there is a range. We have all kinds of sizes firms. So I think that it's basically this idea of exploring all the possible instruments. And that's one that has not been mentioned much. You had mentioned it, Elena and other people, but I think that that's something not to forget. And the IIB, uh, has the capacity to do this part. Now, very briefly, we are not going to get into a very uh, technical discussion, but the idea here is precisely that what you want to do is the transformation, the maturity transformation that uh, the ESM does. So you want that if uh, at the end of the story is uh, a country borrowing or region or whoever, that they have long maturities and the way to happen now even better if they were state uh, contingent or if they were in the states because we need to have more counter cyclical policies so spain has uh, grown very fast but has not decreased the debt so we have to take this into account so you want to do this and then what is the best way to finance this nowadays you just play with the whole yield curve and plain short, nowadays is a win-win. If you want to finance with a very long thing, well, there's a huge uncertainty on the road. So if you have to finance directly with the very long terms, particularly with large sums, that's gonna be very costly. And in particular, these perpetual bonds are very sensitive to changes in interest rates. So it's not by accident that historically people have gone out of that. And it's not by accident that the best uh, DMOs, agencies to, to manage debt in every country have gone out of that. I understand the concern of, the, of, of Luis and the parliament to design something that we can say, look, if we can guarantee it's just 1% a year. But I think that's, uh, that's a trap. Okay, Luis, you have to wait though to respond to this trap. Jan. <laughs> Word on the, on the equity issue again. Um, the, the massive um, involvement of public resources has been so far, not so much in equity, but in credit guarantees. Uh, so Germany has uh, committed 400 billion in credit guarantees. France has committed 300 billion. So, I mean, the depth of the, of the pockets um, is, a, is a strong determinant of what is provided in terms of liquidity so far. 
to firms, many of them small firms, many very small firms. And part of that will have to be transformed into either debt forgiveness or equity at a wholesale level. I mean, we need a wholesale instrument for equity. So when we're speaking of equity, we tend to think of, you know, um, active uh, shareholder, um, the state becoming an active shareholder. We're dealing with, a, I mean, th there are cases of this sort, obviously, but we're dealing with a much more massive problem of many small businesses that uh, have been hit, you know, on their balance sheet. They've, they've, they've had a shock on their balance sheet. And so, so far they've been provided liquidity and at some point you have to address the solvency problem. And I think that would be a strong, strong case for the EU being involved there because, you know, it's not, it's not tinkering with national champions. We're speaking of small firms, we're speaking of restaurants, we're speaking, you know, I mean, all those small businesses that sort of are, are the, the substance, the basic substance of economic activity. And here, um, I mean, you, you need to design schemes that uh, force banks to other creditors to accept some restructuring, um, but also accept some restructuring of the, of the guarantees provided by the, by the state. And so that would be a way in which um, uh, you could be involved. Now to your, to your question, on the ESM, I wouldn't touch the ESM. I mean, basically, you know, we have it for the URI. Yeah, it's not, um, it's not perfect. We have all this discussion uh, about uh, the community method, but the, the instrument is, is, is there. Um, it can serve. Uh, I think the stigma of ESM, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wrong um, perception. I mean, the problem is not the ESM per se as an institution. The, the problem was the conditionality attached to the credit lines that were provided. I mean, the, problem, the, the conditionality problem has been solved and the maturity problem, I would have wished longer maturity, but you know, 10 years is, is, is already significant. So I think we shouldn't uh, sort of go back. Uh, I would go back to the uh, SGP. Obviously the SGP, this, this is a major issue. Uh, the, the two lessons uh, from this crisis is first that you know, the German lesson is um, th this view that the public debt uh, evolves by jumps. Uh, so every 10 years or so, you have a jump, the public debt goes up by 20 or 30 percentage points. We had the, Germany had unification and then they had the financial crisis and now they have the, the COVID crisis and perhaps there will be a geopolitical crisis or or, 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 or an ecological crisis. So, you know, it's by discrete jumps and the, this is a sort of frequency of those events tends to increase. And then in the, in the interval, you have to decrease your, your public debt ratio. So you have to be, to be strict on, you know, reducing your level of indebtedness. And, and Germany has been much better than other countries at, at, at doing it. Not, not exclusively for, for fiscal reason, also for reason of economic performance in the case of Italy. Now we have to design a new SGP that uh, gives this an incentive and it will be important because, you know, um, I mean, we, we were very lucky to, to be hit in, by this crisis in, in this kind of a, uh, interest rate environment but uh, cannot be taken for granted. Um, and at the same time, the whole numerology of the, of the Maastricht criteria is just, you know, is just dead. I mean, it, it, it did not want to survive this crisis. So there needs to be a sort of new contract. And I think rebuilding this contract uh, is a task we shouldn't wait too long to start because otherwise the temptation would be just to sort of reinstate the SGP as, as it was. Okay, maybe let me just add one uh, word, a single word in this equity, given that Ramon has uh, somehow suggested that I do it. I, I fully agree with the idea of the need of providing equity to firms. I think we need to distinguish indeed, as Jeanne was also saying, two firms, I mean, two different categories. The large listed ones for which we do have equity instrument and uh, depending on how, how much we want to influence the governance, we can go in normal equity instrument or prefer the equity shares so that we don't have the same intrusion in the governance of the company. But the main issue is indeed the SMEs, so the, all, the unlisted companies. And for that, we, I think there's the need to be a little bit more creative. So we want to have equity instrument 
that possibly do not interfere with the, with the governance. So in reality, they are not really equity, they are equity-like. And the equity-like comes from the fact that the companies should repay them once they become back to profitability. And we can discuss what that means. And if we go this way, then yes, I, I'm all in favor, as Ramon also suggested, of the European Investment Bank being involved, but the numbers are so high, I mean, so large of how many firms this would be, that is inevitable that we will need to construct, as Jean was mentioning before, a sort of two levels, the European Investment Bank, and then a network probably of the national development banks. They seem to be the obvious candidates and they are present in most countries. And we have to create this type of network. And why European? Because this go back to Marco initial point, we need to decrease divergence and fragmentation among countries. And therefore, we need to restore a sort of level playing field across countries on this matter. And equity is clearly, given that it's related to solvency and related to long term, is clearly where we should uh, at least spend a lot of attention in terms of recreating this level playing field. Having that, I finished to abuse of my prerogative. So, Luis, please. And one no. more question for you, yes. if I may was on energy taxes. You mentioned these taxes, but there was a participant that wanted to ask if these taxes are already there, what are the expenses that are used these taxes for at the moment? And if you convert these taxes towards the restructuring recovery fund, what happens to this current expenditure? Okay, I'll answer, I'll answer that. I, I will just first start with the equity point. I agree with the three of you, Jean Ramon, and, and I think it's great that Ramon raised it that uh, we will have to have the restructuring. And I, I, my point was going to be, Elena, and, and, and you said it uh, very well. Uh, we should try to move towards preferred equity, avoid political interference of governments. I mean, especially government like Spain, other populist governments could, some members of the government like Spain, could see this as a way to nationalize firms and, and, and interfere in the economy. And I think that would be the wrong lesson, uh, or the wrong outcome of this crisis. So yes, uh, to, to equity-like instruments, in particular preferred equity. Second, on maturity, and Ramon mentioned that the first time and I didn't come back and I'm sorry about that. Um, yes, uh, Parliament didn't put perpetual bonds in the resolution. We're not pushing perpetual bonds anymore. I realize it's politically very sensitive in Northern Europe. Um, I, I do still think that long-term maturity is preferred to long-term maturities. I don't think we should just be at one point of the of the curve. I think that we should go all over the yield curve, 10, 20, 30. I wouldn't go lower than 10. And the reason, Ramon, for me is that, I mean, the commission is a new kid in town. It's playing, it's borrowing this money for the first time. I think putting on top of the commission, the European commission, the roller over risk, seems to me excessive. I mean, I think it's better that they just issue this debt, that the debt is issued, they can they can do whatever they need to do to fund this recovery. And that you don't have to have debt management office, you don't have a, to, to try to be rolling over if this is going to be problematic. Obviously, I also believe that at some point, something's going to happen to this debt. Maybe inflation is going to be the solution, partly. Uh, and I agree with Elena's comment on this. So she said, well, you know, you, you, you want to lock these low interest rates uh, in. So I still, even though I agree with both of you that perpetual bonds might not, uh, well, are not a solution given the political sensitivities, I do still believe that the commission should try to be, uh, I, I don't know, Marco, if, if you guys will mention something already in parliament next Wednesday, but the commission should try to borrow on the long, term, long uh, part of the yield curve, uh, 10, 20, look for an average maturity of around 20 years that is going to, allow us to lock in this kind of interest rate we're talking about at one or even below one percent for a very long period um third on the energy taxes no to our to our reader those are, are new energy taxes those are new own resources we wouldn't be distracting them from from old uses to new uses the plastic recycling task which marco very rightly said it's an unstable source of revenue because it's its vocation is to go away um, the ETS expansion, that might be more stable to, to heatings and to, and to kerosene, etc. Uh, these are taxes that, uh, they, for example, the border adjustment mechanism, that won't be a, a provisional tax. That's going to be something that will ensure that companies that are outside of the European Union don't have to pay carbon prices, are actually forced to pay these carbon prices or carbon taxes. These are three mechanisms that don't exist and that would be new on resources and that would allow you to tap new sources of taxation that would also solve some extent my 
Uh, Elena, can I come in? Yes, sure, you should. That was your turn, please. Okay, it was my turn. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. No, I mean, uh, um, very last point by Luis, I think interesting. I think we have to screen out the um, possibilities for new own resources in the light of what is happening right now. Uh, so to see also what is robust to, to, for the you know for the crisis uh, or not. Uh, for instance, uh, if what uh, uh, I think was discussed in the past, uh, which I think now you know would not be feasible at all, is on a, you know tax on aviation. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the uh, airline companies in such a you know pitiful state. Uh, uh, that seemed to be not uh, not a brilliant idea. Um, the second one, which instead, at least from a conceptual analytical viewpoint, would would come out uh, as stronger uh, out of the crisis, would be a common consolidated tax base, corporate uh, corporate tax base, because uh, that would help uh, to reduce uh, uh, the fragmentation within 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 the single market. Which is precisely one of the points uh, of uh, that I on which I insisted before to tackle the divergence. So um, there, okay, all the political, uh, uh, you know, uh, rumbling uh, we know we know about, uh, you know, low low uh, tax countries, aggressive tax behavior, uh, etc. So, but anyway, this is I think is a it's a it's a good point. On the um, let me just say one word uh, uh, on the intergovernmental issues. It is true that uh, compared to the far past, uh, the um, France and Germany are not anymore the representative agents of their group. Mm -hmm. So the fact that uh, they simply uh, agree between them in the past was enough to carry the whole EU. Now it is not like that uh, any longer. However, uh, as, as an element of uh, you know glimpse of hope here is that I, I really hope and I'm convinced that we do not have, we are not going to see the typical follow-up like uh, in the Meseberg declaration. This Meseberg uh, was uh, two years ago, uh, France and Germany, they agreed on something. The ink was not uh, uh, dry yet uh, and in Berlin and with the help, uh, um, let's say, to, of uh, you know, some of the Anseatic countries, they started to undermine this and eventually uh, the, uh, the, the, this uh, declaration, which had a number of uh, things that we find the new declaration actually would died, uh, you know, in its infancy. I think right now, politically, the awareness of the evolution of the situation, the typology of the shock, the fact that the government, the Angela Merkel has put her face on this uh, very much on this new agreement makes me uh, a bit more uh, optimistic that uh, then Germany would also do the job and try to convince uh, the uh, more frugal uh, countries. Um, on the uh, SGP, uh, now we had launched uh, um, before the crisis, actually we launched in February, a review of the uh, um, Stability and Growth Pact as well as the other uh, tools of surveillance, so MIP also, um, launching a um, public consultation which actually was supposed to expire uh, in the summer for then drawing the conclusions on possible reforms of the pact or reinterpretation of the pact by the end of the year. Clearly this has been put on uh, hold uh, and we are going to, to, you know, after the summer restart again unless we, you know, we continue to be in a huge mess. But that will be the restarting of, the, of this consultation, which will have to take into account not only what underpinned the initial consultation uh, and uh, which was the, the, um, uh, the experience uh, and lessons learned from the financial crisis, but also lessons learned from this, from this crisis. So I think we will have to put the lessons from the two uh, crisis experience and draw the, con uh, draw the conclusions on uh, that. Ideally, and then I say ideally, uh, whether it, is, uh, it proves uh, institutionally feasible or not, uh, that remains to be seen, but we have now activated the general escape clause for the stability and growth pact. This was actually one of the most uh, important, relevant, and not easy uh, decisions at the very beginning of the crisis by the Commission. One would want to uh, repeal the general escape clause while entering into the new rules. Mm -hmm. So to have uh, 
a uh, seamless transition between uh, you know the repeal of the of the clause and then the application of the uh, of the new rules so this is uh, in theory uh, i think um, in in practice we'll have to see because we know that uh, uh, things can be done more quickly uh, by uh, interpretation if one changes the regulation it takes a long time um, for unanimity uh, uh, or consensus on this so we'll have to see but i think this is the would be the ideal uh, situation what do we see i think from the present crisis i think the imperative of creating the conditions for more investment uh, is there uh, in our spring forecast published um, uh, 10 days ago uh, we estimate the uh, shortfall in investment compared due to the crisis end of 2021 with so with all the uncertainty obviously compared to what we had uh, projected before the crisis in our autumn 2019 uh, uh, forecast is 850 billion so there is this investment repair that is important and investment repair of the good sort going back to the question on the european green deal so if we can foster even more that type of, of investment uh, I think that would be uh, key. Second, uh, the importance of, as uh, Jean said, that of putting public debt uh, on a downwards uh, trajectory in the medium term and in a credible way, not uh, you know by a, a brutal austerity, but uh, through um, reforms uh, which uh, help both the numerator and the denominator. So in the medium term, a, a decrease in debt uh, for high debt countries, not uh, not for everybody. There is the issue of the safe asset here, which uh, on which there is a lot of thirst uh, in the market. But this would be the so I think more emphasis on uh, boosting investment and creating the conditions for that, and uh, I think more attention on having a coherent medium-term uh, behavior of uh, of public debt. I think uh, seems to me will be at the center of uh, the discussion once we restart the um, uh, consultation on the on the review clause for the pact thank you very much we are already five minutes late i don't know whether ramon and jean want to add the final word maybe jean first this time and then we we would need to close uh, just a, a word to regret that um, the point about climate that you you wrote at some point was not taken up i think this the way we transition from the emergency phase um, to the uh, you know, transformation phase is crucial. They, they, they've actually on that and on economic sovereignty, the Franco-German declaration has uh, some strong words, at least in terms of commitment. Now the question of how to do it is, is, is crucial, especially as resources will be less um, than what we had before. So, so the, the, the trade-offs will be major. But we, we don't have time to discuss that. Next webinar, Jean. Ramon, yeah. last word. Hello, everyone. And, but just one thing, whatever is done, it needs to be done very efficiently. I mean, the challenge is huge and people will be observing. So I think it's very important with this uh, fund, the recovery fund is done properly, it's managed properly. We use all the capacities, even if they are in the ASM, on the IV, or whatever. Because uh, after all, the only thing that to regain trust will be the North and South, they mutually see that things are done responsibly. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. I would add also, so I just want to add it to, to Ramon effective, uh, I mean, efficiently and effective, but also fast, because we can't wait uh, possibly too long. So with this, uh, let me close the panel. Thank you very much. As Marco and Luis said, maybe there was too much agreement, but I nevertheless, I think it was very useful. So thank you for Ramon again for organizing it and to all of you for participating. Thank you and goodbye to everybody. Thanks to all of you. It was really, uh, thank you all. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for the participants. Bye-bye.